everybody. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. My name is Brian Checo. I'm the director of marketing here at AINet. Um, we are the company that has helped to put this on and uh, with, with cooperation from a lot of these great panelists we've got here today. So I want to thank you all for coming out here. Um, I know the weather was, was not great. And uh, otherwise, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I'm going to turn it over to Michael Asicki, who's the author of Hutzlers, where Baltimore shops, and he is our panel moderator. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much. My name is Michael Lasicki. I am the author of Hutzlers for Baltimore Shops, along as Baltimore Bygone's Apartment Store, but I may also be known more in town as being an oboist with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. When I wrote the book in 2009 about Hutzlers, I wasn't sure if anybody still remembered Hutzlers or still cared about Hutzlers. Hutzlers, uh, my book outsold Danielle Steele for about one month, and I realized that people still do care about this, about the business and even the building that we're in right now. Just a few words about Hutzlers. Hutzlers was founded in 1858 and the building that you're sitting in right now opened in September of 1888. You'll see the term Hutzlers Palace referred to uh, in any type of promotional materials. Palace is a Baltimore term. It means a kind of uh, buildings that combine ornate architecture with depth of merchandise. The building across the street from us which housed Stewart's was also considered a palace even though it didn't open until 1902 and then Bernheimer Leader which is over on Fayette Street. If you notice that, that is also one of the remaining three palaces in this town. This building served as a connection. Uh, I connected the former uh, Hutzler store, the Art Deco building, and some others that connected with it in completed in 1932, the tower in 1942. It connected with the building that was next door. It used to be the Hoshel Cohn department store that closed in 1977. It was Warren Buffett's first private investment in 1966 when he opened that up. But the Hutzlers, the person that came in to purchase Hutzlers in 1983 decided to move the store next door, the site of the burned location of Hoshels, which uh, burns in a spectacular fire. So this building served as kind of a connection, a connection where a store that was a family store did not last long because of its independence, tried to reinvent itself on the other side of this beautiful palace structure. Tonight we're going to be hearing that term connections when we talk about Baltimore, the future of Baltimore, especially in regards to collaborating and technology. That's going to be kind of a real key term for this symposium tonight. And um, I'm thrilled to be a part of this symposium, thrilled to be back in Hutzlers. Nobody has been in this building for the past 30 years, June 1987, the last time anybody walked through those front doors. And it's exciting to have AINet um, open the doors and to have the contemporary um, sponsor this wonderful exhibition here that has brought life back to Howard Street, and that's hopefully what we can continue to do here. So we have this panel today. The panel is called Future Cities Baltimore. And just a little bit about the promotion is, um, and it represents the leaders in f fields of education, manufacturing, urban development, technology, and the arts. We're all coming together to discuss ways that collaboration can drive the future of Baltimore. Um, we're going to be discussing synergies between these fields that could put Baltimore on its path to the 21st century to emulate, address change challenges and opportunities for the city as it moves forward to the future. I'll be keeping an eye on the, on the clock as we talk because we want to make sure everybody has ample time to talk about themselves, talk about the organization, and then answer questions or talk amongst themselves and to have questions from the audience. So I'd like you to um, in welcome our six panelists that we have here today. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, go down the row and let them introduce themselves, let them introduce, talk a little bit about their organization, and maybe what really draw, drew them to be part of this important symposium being held here on Howard Street. So the first person that I'm going to turn over to will be Will Holman, who's with the general manager of OpenWorks. Hey, how's everyone doing tonight? Thanks for coming out. So my name's Will, I'm the general manager at OpenWorks, which opened about five and a half months ago at 1400 Greenmount Avenue, across from the historic cemetery there. Or for those of you more familiar with today's kind of more recent development, right by City Arts. Um, we are a 34,000 square foot maker space. So that's kind of a new term. And what we mean by that is we are a space that offers shared access to tools and technology. 
We are not the first maker space in town. There are about a dozen in town. Um, some are single discipline, like Baltimore Print Studios or Baltimore Clayworks. Um, some are spin-offs of other programs, like Baltimore Jewelry Center, which started at MICA. Then we have a bunch of independent hacker spaces like the Node and Baltimore Hacker Space and the Station North Tool Library, and then the Foundry down in the Port Covington development. So it's really exciting to be in Baltimore in this time, working on projects like this. We are kind of a national leader, uh, very quietly have become a national leader for development of this type of open access tech space. And I'm really excited to see what that leads to over the next couple years in the city. Thank you, Will. Our next panelist is Dr. Richard Barth, who's the Dean of the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Good evening. It's great to see you all out tonight. Um, I am indeed the proud Dean of the University of Maryland School of Social Work, which was founded, oh, about four blocks from here in 1961. Um, we've been community engaged ever since then, but none more than we have in the last six years or so since Jay Perman came uh, to lead our campus and has really turned our efforts and focused our efforts on what's going on in West Baltimore. The campus itself is um, uh, expanding and uh, not only in its interests but in its properties and we are now in five, the School of Social Work alone is now in five different buildings in West Baltimore. Uh, we are working closely with AINet as you'll hear about some more, and that's how I ended up on the stage tonight. Um, but the other thing that's really key to why I wanted to be here is that we've been a federally recognized promised neighborhood for the last five years or so. We started that work in 2008, um, and we work in Upton and Druid Heights especially, but now also in Sandtown Winchester. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for partnerships uh, for the five schools that we help to provide services to as community schools. Uh, those kids, their families, those communities have significant needs that we know we can't meet as a school of social work alone, and the schools know they can't meet as Baltimore City Public Schools, and we need everybody uh, to help with that. Next, uh, next panelist is Deepak Jain, who's the CEO of AINet. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I founded AINet when I was 17 and two servers in my mother's basement, and now a few years later, feels like a few years later, uh, here we are in one of our recent building acquisitions, the largest data center in Baltimore. AINet provides data centers, fiber optic networks, cloud services. It's all super technical. What I really like about it is that we help people deliver pizzas and trade stocks and launch space shuttles. And we are looking to see how we can bring technology to bear to help interconnection and collaboration to lead Baltimore to the future, support Baltimore's future, um, and, and sort of better outcomes for all of Baltimore. Thank you. Our next panelist is Anita Kassoff, who is Executive Director of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Hello, thanks for having me tonight. My name's Anita Kassoff, and I took the uh, helm of the Baltimore Museum of Industry about two years ago. Um, I. I like to say that um, because Baltimore's industrial past is so much a part of our identity as a city, that we are really the city's history museum. We were established about 35 years ago by then Mayor uh, William Donald Schaefer to preserve what was then a very fast disappearing material record of Baltimore's industry. Between 1970 and the late 1990s, we lost 90,000 manufacturing jobs. Today, um, we are committed not just to honoring that industrial past, but also very much looking at industries of today, industries of tomorrow, and providing a space, a forum for important discussions about these issues that are relevant to people today that have to do with the future of industry. Um, Brian had, had talked to us when we were sort of planning for this panel about um, thinking about um, challenges and opportunities that we face. And I would say for us, for the museum, our challenge and our opportunity are one and the same. And that is the gift of our location. For those of you who have been to the BMI, you know that we are on what's possibly one of the best waterfront spots in Baltimore. 
on the south side of the harbor in um, what is a rapidly growing neighborhood um, with a lot of commercial and residential development. And so we are really committed to making sure that we're making the most of our outdoor space, that we use it not only to bring the stories that we tell inside the museum outside, um, but also that we um, provide a, a gathering space for community because great cities rely on great public space, and we have that space. So we're looking through campus master planning and, and other activities to see what we can do to make sure that we're providing for the city um, more than just what's inside the four walls of our museum. Thank you. Our next panelist is Kirby Fowler, the president of the Downtown Partnership of Baltimore. Great, thank you, and good evening. Uh, the Downtown Partnership came into existence about 30 some years ago, and we were focused initially on this commercial district, but thankfully over the years, thanks to uh, a lot of different um, activities and uh, work of many, many people, we've been able to convert this downtown into a mixed-use district. Uh, we are now ninth in the country in terms of the number of residents in a downtown area and 13th in employment. Uh, most importantly, these skyscrapers that are being renovated for residential are, are bringing a very diverse uh, set of residents. Uh, this has been identified as the fastest growing neighborhood in the entire city as well as one of its most integrated, so we're very happy about what's happening here. Uh, we do have many successes in downtown. Uh, one of our remaining challenges has been Howard Street, so we're, I'm glad to see that we're starting to turn a corner finally on Howard Street after decades and decades of disinvestment. Uh, but before we go on, I'd like to mention, I was able to get behind these walls, uh, the old Hoshul Cone building a few years ago, and I stupidly was by myself, and I had my, f my little cell phone camera, and I got to see counter spaces that had old 1980s graphics or 70s graphics uh, in cosmetic space. I could have fallen through a floor and my body would still be back there, but th thankfully I got out. But it's incredible what's in, in these buildings, the history, but also the great architecture. And I want to thank Annette for bringing this building back to life with the help of the contemporary. Thank you. And our final uh, panelist is Dina Hagag, who's the outgoing executive director of the contemporary. Hello. I'm Dina Hagag. I'm the outgoing executive director of The Contemporary. Um, I joke a lot that I'm outgoing because I don't want to have to take Michael's project down, so I quit before I had to do that. Um, so uh, I work for The Contemporary, which is a nomadic, non-collecting art museum that was founded in Baltimore in 1989. Uh, we commission site-specific projects with artists throughout the city. Our latest, which we are all seated next to, is The Ground by uh, Michael Jones McKean, who's in the audience somewhere. If you can find Michael, you get a prize. Um, this project opened last month and will be open until late May. And one of the ways that we are able to do any of this, we're a five-person team, myself, uh, Lou and Ginevra, who are right here, and Lee, who's somewhere in this audience. Uh, we're not a lot of people, and we definitely can't do anything like this on the small scale that we operate at, so we have to collaborate. Uh, our first collaborator on this project was Kirby in the Downtown Partnership, uh, Ginevra, um, to what we were talking about earlier with Hutzlers, one person cared deeply about Hutzlers and has for years, and that is Ginevra Shea, who in our first week at our office was like, we should get into that building. And Kirby found a way to get us in. We met Deepak, Brian, and Jonathan, and Pam, who are all sort of the staff at AINet, and started cooking up a plan to open something here this year. Um, and we invited Michael from there to sort of investigate the building, the area, and to build this project as a result. Thank you, That's Dina. all. Well, at this point, now that we've met all the panelists, I'm going to pose a question or two to each one and have them answer it, and um, also encourage any type of answers or continued dialogue within the panel itself. So I'm just going to kind of randomly pick some of the pick some of these questions, and I'm going to start with with uh, with Richard in regards to uh, since we're here with collaborations and connections, talking about technology. And when I read about uh, what we wanted to talk about, the term that comes up is the digital divide. Can you just talk a little bit about the term divi the digital divide and how your organization, the University of Maryland School of Social Work, is addressing that issue in some of the communities, especially here in Baltimore? Sure. <clears throat> so the digital divide has to do with um, the division between the haves, the digital haves, those who can get access uh, to the internet on a regular basis, those who are networked to others, and the digital have-nots, those who may occasionally get access, but it's not dependable because their access gets shut down because they can't pay the bills, or they can get access on a cell phone, but they don't have a netbook or a computer, or they have a computer that's very slow, and 
basically the digital divide is um, now become a real civil rights issue. Uh, to be connected in this society is critical to your success, whether you're trying to pay bills or settle traffic uh, tickets or deal with the courts or have your kids do homework. You need connectedness and you need quality connectedness. Um, there are at least two ways that the students that we see and that we work with in West Baltimore, uh, there are many more than this, but at least two I'll mention, uh, what the cost is for them of having low connectedness or no connectedness. For one thing, they simply can't do their homework in many cases. Um, so you'll see kids sometimes sitting outside the library, uh, a brother and a sister, maybe more, looking at a cell phone uh, that's a smartphone that might have a broken screen, trying to download um, con uh, math tutoring programs or something that their teacher has put up on the web and trying to figure out how to download that so they can do their homework. Um, the other part of the digital divide that I think this group will really relate to is the investigative divide. All of us probably grew up when we had a question looking in books and now you look on the internet. And that is a critical skill for any kind of success that you're gonna have. Um, if you can't pursue knowledge at the time you need it, then that's a huge um, uh, detriment of the digital divide. And the kids who are experiencing the digital divide, and this is well more than half of all poor kids in the country, and we don't have a great estimate about what it's like in Upton or Druid Heights or Sandtown, but it's gotta be uh, no more than 20% really have the access that allows them to be curious and to investigate and to pursue their dreams of what they should know. Right. Um, I know in order to, to take advantage of a di the digital divide and to have access. To close the digital divide. To, to close the digital divide, exactly. Um, who can you partner with in order to facilitate this? Is there an organization in town, whether commercial or civic, that could help facilitate this, whether it's through the actual, um, let's say the machinery or the device that can help um, bring, this, um, bring this to some of the lower served neighborhoods? So um, in the sort of simplest terms, We've been clear as a nation that we should close the digital divide by helping schools to be networked uh, since the end of the last century. So a lot of that is done, although not perfectly. Then we became aware that we should try to get families connected in the last decade. So we've been working on that some. There are a few programs um, that are run by uh, private industry that reduce the cost of being connected. Uh, certainly. Um, in some cities, they even have trucks that go by and that you can go in and do your homework. Um, that's the kind of thing, that's the level that we really need in, in West Baltimore. Um, there have been a few projects uh, that haven't gone very far, and I don't have the history of all those, and no one wants to hear about failures anyway. Um, but I think the, the biggest um, efforts really are the libraries and the schools. Those are the best places for uh, students who need to be digitally connected and to close the digital divide. And then we started a conversation with AINet. Um, turns out that our uh, information technology uh, hub for the campus is in a building that where they're leasing space from AINet. Uh, Peter Murray, who's our um, uh, chief information technology officer, had some conversations with Deepak, who you hear from as soon as I stopped dominating the mic, and they started talking about what we might do together. Um, we have an opportunity to become a federally um, funded promised neighborhood, uh, and we'll be applying again as soon as they release an RFP for that. And we went to AINet and said, would you help us? One of the things that's required in this proposal is that we provide 21st century learning tools to the students in our promised neighborhood. And there's nothing uh, more important to that than um, connectedness. So, uh, the short answer to your question is the best partner we can think of and that we're delighted to be working with is AINet. Okay. Anita, I wanted to ask you a question with, uh, um, in regards to the Baltimore Museum of Industry and museums in general. Um, it also kind of jumps upon what we just discussed and a museum, especially one of uh, yours, is a real 
serve as a repository of, of history, of culture, of documenting that. Um, how would that, do you feel that that type of knowledge plays into some of the roles that we're talking here in regards to looking towards the future? The, as you study and document the past, can you tell me a little bit about what your museum does and how it looks forward to working with the future, especially as we think about it occupationally? Sure. So I think that um, that's a lot of questions. Oh, <laughs> so, just one, so, okay, so I'll, I'll start with sort of what museums I think need to do today in order to be relevant and be meaningful. And that is to acknowledge that people are consuming knowledge in a very different way um, than they did in the past. You know, when a museum might have been beautiful objects behind a case with didactic curatorial text. Um, people in the, in the age of social media are much more accustomed to an interactive kind of knowledge gathering and providing feedback. And I think that smart museums have to work with that, that new reality so um, that we are conveners, that we're creating a space where people can come and have dialogue. I mean, much as we're doing now in this forum, inspired by the presence of this artwork in this particular location. In terms of the Baltimore Museum of Industry, as I said, we're really committed to talking about these contemporary issues that have to do with work and the evolving nature of work. A lot of museums struggle with relevance. We don't really feel we do struggle with relevance because we're about something that is so deeply meaningful to everybody. Everybody, you know, either has worked, wants to work, aspires to work, will work, wishes they could work. Um, and there are a lot of really interesting, especially now in this political climate, a lot of really interesting um, questions about work. What does offshoring mean? What are the impacts of robotics on the workforce? Um, how is artificial intelligence shaping the workforce? All these kinds of questions are really contemporary and really interesting. So last spring, we, we did a series on the human impacts of deindustrialization. Um, next fall, we're doing a, a whole program series on the future of work. And again, we'll address some of these issues. And this spring, we're doing a program series um, about the intersections of art and industry. Um, which gets to sort of a, a, another thing that, that successful museums need to do, which is to make sure that we're interdisciplinary and really stretching the boundaries of what we do all the time. So next week, we're opening an art exhibition. Um, we're a history museum. Um, it's an exhibition by a, a local machinist and sculptor, sculptor named Chris Bathgate, who um, uses machines that are cast-offs of the industrial process. He retrofits them. He computerizes them. He uses them to make these beautiful, almost luminous, machined metal sculptures. And those sculptures are a commentary on the intersection between art and industry. He likes to talk about the fact that um, with the emergence of desktop manufacturing, there are whole new ways for artists and artisans to create art, art that are starting to move that kind of practice from utilitarian to aesthetic. So um, I don't know if I've answered your questions, but I think that I, I think the point is that um, museums need to stretch, they need to be cognizant of the way people are working today and learning today, um, and they absolutely need to collaborate, and I, you know, we can talk about that later, but I'll stop hogging the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Dina, I'm curious to know a little bit more, um, considering the contemporary. I'd like you to say a few words about how the contemporary is structured and what really pushed your organization to bring this life back to Howard Street? What really, um, what really was a motivation there? Because this truly works as a, as a collaboration between two pretty, as we see it, separate entities. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that maybe jumping off what Anita was saying, that our, um, the contemporary was founded with that spirit in mind, right? Like how can an entity exist that is sort of by design flexible and responsive and nimble to the circumstances of the community and the, the citizens it serves? Um, and I think it's upheld that pretty successfully over the past 30 years. So for us, I think maybe a, a jumping off point that would be interesting for this conversation is we, in our mission statement, we sort of, um, we believe in three core values. One is that artists matter, and we put them at the core, obviously, of everything that we do. We're an arts museum. Um, we don't pretend or posit to be anything else. Uh, the second is that collaboration is key. Again, we talked a little bit earlier about how we're just too small. We don't have the power, frankly, to do things at the scale that we'd like to do them. And since our founding and to this day, we've done everything in collaboration with others. Sometimes those are arts organizations. Oftentimes they are not. Um, and that's been a pretty successful model for us. And I can talk a little bit about this particular project in a second. 
And then the last one, audiences everywhere, um, has been the one that we are still sitting in a place with, right? So what does it mean to be a museum that can speak to many different audiences? Sometimes at the same time, sometimes not. Right, and what does it mean to, to decide on behalf of a city what an audience is or can be and how do we learn from that as we move along? So in the case of this project, when we first met with Kirby, the conversation was that there had been very little activity on Howard Street. I mean, there's some amazing things happening on Howard Street, art activity, otherwise, all up and down this corridor. Um, but this particular block we were looking at a lot because of the depth and breadth of the buildings that are on it and how long they had been shuttered to the public. Um, and when Kirby had expressed an interest and a willingness to help us figure this out, and Deepak and Brian and the rest of the folks at AINET kind of came in and said, you can use the building, it then became, well, who are we speaking to on this corridor? And that's everybody from the street, street traffic, do people come down here often? Can you raise your hand if you've been down here, not for this project in the past month, on this block? What do you come down here for? Can somebody just shout it out from the end? Do you use the light rail? Fried chicken. Fried chicken, okay. Lamondo, so that's an art project that's being built up on this corridor just a few blocks up. What else? Fornos. Fornos, restaurants. Okay, so you come down here for either entertainment, food. Lexington Market, yes. But see, okay, so I have another thing. I am talking literally the front of this building. Not Lexington Market, not Fornos, not Lamondo. I mean this exact entrance. Has anybody been down here in the past month not due to this project? Okay, see how, so what does that say about our city block to block, right? Like people come to neighborhoods, but they don't necessarily come to individual blocks. And I think that was something at the outset that we were interested in, especially the downtown partnership. For our art project, I think another thing that was compelling for us is not just the history of these buildings, but quite literally the scale of them. We were interested for Michael's project in a big open space, right? And that's something we couldn't find too much of in Baltimore at the time that we were searching. So I think it was a lot of things that we were juggling midair to make a project like this happen. Um, in terms of how does something like this come to life, there's so many factors involved in that. In addition to thinking about an audience, logistics, a budget, time, how do we actually make a thing? We then invite an artist to interpret something however way they want to, you know? And Michael spent roughly a year thinking specifically about this building, three years thinking with us about Baltimore, and ultimately decided to make a thing that I think really mirrors a lot of the conversations that are happening right now in the world, and in our country especially, around issues of excess and technology and humanity's relationship to all of these things at the same time in our memory and space. So. It's a very long way of saying, I think that we're sort of designed to be collaborators and that any time the contemporary has tried not to behave that way, it has never worked for itself. And I think that it would be wonderful to see more of that kind of spirit in the way that our administrations and our other cities function. And I think that's what's so nice about hearing about partnerships like the School of Social Work and AINET or something like an art museum and ostensibly sort of a private city agency that deals with downtown. I mean, beautiful things happen. So. I'll, I'll be done hugging the mic since that seems to be a theme no. of the evening. <laughs> no, it's interesting when I've, I've talked about Hutzler's itself. Step, um, when they moved to that building next door, it was no, really, it was no longer Hutzler's. When it opened in 1985, I asked how many people ever went to that palace store that was next door. Usually around 10% of the hands of an audience go up, and I say, how many people went back? And probably 10% of those hands go up. It was something that was not relevant for, it was not downtown Baltimore at that point. Looking at downtown Baltimore, I have to look at Kirby because um, on a selfish note, let me just say that um, I make my living down at the uh, Meyerhoff Mount Royal Arts District and we have the Bromo Arts District and Howard Street serves as this almost seemingly no man's land between the two. Um, how do you see as a way to connect how connect those two arts districts together, and also connecting, let's say, the Lexington Market area down towards the financial district. I know we had a chuckle earlier about the superblock, uh -huh. but I'm curious to see what um, your vision for connecting all these different neighborhoods. Well, you mentioned the Bromo Arts District, and that, that is the vision. Uh, it, the Station North Arts District has had great success under Ben Stone and many other people uh, in the room here. Uh, Bromo can have a slightly different character to it. First of all, it's, uh, it's north-south oriented, uh, and it's, it's hard to connect a lot of those things along a very long Howard Street, Utah Street corridor. We have at the, the southern end, we have basically the theater district. Uh, in the central area, we probably will have 
have the creative artist district, more grassroots art, art, artistic uh, offerings. And then the northern part could be more, uh, we have Antique Row, you have some more restaurants and connect into, again, more established institutions like the Meyerhof. Um, and so, so you have a lot of different characters going up along the way, but we have to connect those have the connective tissue um, to make it all happen. And you're right about asking people how many people go on this block because it is going block to block. You have to build on the strengths that we have uh, occurring here. Hopefully this project will be a catalyst for what could happen around here. But really, and some of you, like from the current space, we met last week to talk about the 400, 500, 600 blocks of North Howard Street. And talk about collaboration, we brought in all the different property owners and users of those blocks just to first talk about what they're doing. You have to have the knowledge for to move on to the next steps. But there's a great center of activity happening in the 400, 500 blocks uh, with LaMondo current space and with the residential and more. Uh, so you got to build on that strength. But maybe this will be the opportunity for us to build on the strength in these blocks. Uh, Everyman Theater is seeking some additional space just a block it, uh, from here. Uh, and Lexington Market uh, will we'll have some new life uh, co coming soon. Uh, so we, we have to fill in the pieces first, but we have to have first the, the core, and again, I think the 400 block is going to be very strong, the 500 block is going to be very strong in, of Howard Street. But if we can get back to the collaboration just for one minute, there's two things I think that we have to do, and I've been thinking prior to, to well, in preparation for today's session. One is that we need to get out of our silos a little bit. You know, I'm not going to blame the internet for this, especially since ANET is the sponsor of this <laughs> event today. But it seems like we're talking to ourselves a lot. Uh, and so it's important to get out of our silos and, and bump into people. And it's important to get out, get out and see each other. And so, you know, we have Dina who's connected with, to the artist community and I'm connected to the property owners. And if we didn't connect through uh, different people we knew or through s different social activities. Uh, perhaps this, we wouldn't have connected together to lead to this. And um, also, we, the second thing is you have to challenge your own assumptions because I assumed before Ginevra and Dina and I went and met with Deepak that th he would never agree. I didn't even know him I, <laughs> at all. Uh, but I assumed, okay, he's a property owner on Howard Street. No one's really thought in a progressive way about Howard Street for a very long time. And so we go in and I'm ready for a stubborn reaction. And instead, he almost embraces us from the start. And, and you don't have that very often. So I think getting out of our sil silos, connecting with other people who don't necessarily fit in our social circles necessarily, but connect and then challenge our assumptions too. Thank you. Sure. Will. When I read about open works, um, I know I, I do see the term that that was unfamiliar to me, um, maker spaces. And if that's a, a buzzword or, or a definition, can you describe, because with open, with open works, you come up with the, uh, this has the access to infra infrastructure, infrastructure of production and maker spaces has an incredible potential to open up economic opportunities for people in the city. Describe what a maker space is and how you see that helping to open up these economic opportunities, especially in some of the neighborhoods here in Baltimore that really need those opportunities. Sure, sure, and I think some of what I'm gonna talk about touches on um, what Anita and Richard were speaking to earlier. So in some ways, makerspaces are very Marxian ideal. We're putting the, the means of production directly back in the hands of the people, right? But over the last 10 or 15 years, as these spaces have sprouted up around the country and around the world, that has tended to be in kind of a, a hobbyist lens or a lens of people who already knew what they were doing, already had a degree, were an engineer or something, and were already wealthy and could do this with their disposable time and income. And part of that has to do with a scale of space and a scale of infrastructure available in a space, right? So if you get a couple folks together, a 3D printer, some hand tools, you're limited in what you can actually make, right? And so um, we are now one of the largest maker spaces in the country, and these spaces have steadily been expanding in scale over the last couple years in particular. And what that opens up is a whole new opportunity economic development-wise. We have three full-size CNC routers which can machine a piece of plywood, right? So you can make a piece of furniture in 45 minutes that might have used to take a day. And then we can have, well, you know, we're open 12 hours a day times three machines times however many members can access it during those hours, right? And that turns into real money for real makers. I would say our audience is split kind of amongst our membership um, 
maybe 50% full or nearly full-time makers, be it in the art world or the industrial design or architecture or whatever it may be, and then sort of 50% on the uh, hobbyist side. And this reflects trends that are happening in the workforce in general, where close to a quarter of the workforce now is a freelancer or a contractual worker. Many of our technicians, some of whom worked installing this project and 3D printing those busts in our facility, um, patch together a bunch of different small jobs um, to kind of add up to one full-time income. I'm not necessarily advocating for this one way or the other, I'm just saying it is sort of the reality of work today, and we can be a flexible platform that's low cost, that's accessible, that allows people to shed some of the sunk costs of equipment and studio space and focus on what they're good at, which is making stuff. And then on sort of the digital divide side, um, the long-term vision for OpenWorks, really on a 10-year horizon, is that the 10 and 12-year-old kids that are coming into our free Saturday programming and our free after-school programming, or the teens who are coming from Baltimore Design School, can then link up with some of our collaborators like CCBC, like Coppin State University, like MICA, find a path to either uh, meaningful trade skills or meaningful education. And then when they graduate and come out of those programs, they can rejoin us to launch their entrepreneurial idea, um, meet a new collaborator or friend, or um, um, come back and start a nonprofit to serve their community. So, Are there any specific projects OpenWorks is working with with other organizations that you would want to talk about? Yes, yeah, so we have a couple exciting things happening right now. One, one thing I want to touch on, it's fresh in my mind because I had a meeting about it today, is um, we have a partnership in place with Coppin State University College of Business, and it's the first partnership between a makerspace and an HBCU in the country. Uh, makerspace have traditionally been seen as space full of a lot of people that look like me, and given the, the makeup of Baltimore City, we thought it was important to start to really push against the notion of what these spaces can and should be. Um, so we pursued a relationship with Coppin. They will be opening a small business center next month within our space to both study small business formation and entrepreneurship inside OpenWorks and in the three neighborhoods surrounding OpenWorks, Green Mount West, Johnson Square, and Barclay. Um, they've been doing this type of work around their campus um, where they go on community walks and gather kind of qualitative data from both the barber shops and the dry cleaners and the chicken boxes and kind of the small scale formal businesses as well as the gray market economy, the shade tree mechanics, the, the women watching children in their backyard or cooking food out of the back of their house and painting a much fuller and richer picture of what work and economic development looks like in Baltimore City than sort of the Bureau of Labor Statistics kind of official portrait of what's going on in, in town. Okay. Deepak, I'm not sure we would be here without you or your firm um, bringing life back to this part of Howard Street. Um, I have to say that uh, I always knew that state offices were in the, this part of Hutzler's over here, but I wasn't sure what was next door and what was in that building. Do you want to discuss a little bit about your firm and what goes on at that corner of Howard and Lexington Street? Oh, sure. So <clears throat> whether you know it or not, uh, the building that the Hutzler's in is attached to what we call the Tower Building. So this is the palace. Um, for the reasons discussed. And the neighboring building is called the Tower. It was burned down in the 80s. 83, yes. And it was rebuilt as a high-tech building next to Lexington, it's basically between here and Lexington Market. And for various reasons, geography and others, it is actually the largest telecommunications hub in the state and one of the largest in the Northeast. So almost all communications going from Northern Virginia to New York to Europe go through that building, under us, through it, and your 911 calls and all sorts of things. So that's AINet's principal interest in why we acquired it and why I've taken such an interest in this space. Um, and I'm just going to totally pivot on that question. 
Well, I mean, I guess what I uh, also would want to know is what would your firm, considering all the technical um, capabilities that you have and what goes on in that building next door, what can it offer to help re uh, rehabilitate or reinvent this Howard Street area and beyond in the city of Baltimore? So that's really exciting for me. So technology is incredibly transformative and disruptive. And, and I'm going to borrow from all of you guys because you guys are great. Um, Baltimore was a, a port city and then an industrial city, and then things changed and disrupted all of that. And Baltimore's been working to find a new uh, vision of itself. And so our concept of future cities is right collaboration between all of the stakeholders, the residents, and, and industry and, and government to figure that out. And technology, again, is disruptive, but it is also collaborative. And getting uh, you know, the means of production into people's hands and getting that publicized on the web or elsewhere, that's stuff that we can do and that's what we can help with. Right? Helping redefine the dignity of work, whether it's you have uh, five jobs, but all of a sudden you're in charge of yourself as a contractor instead of having five different or 10 different bosses. Right? There's dignity in that. And taking uh, spaces that had lost their purpose and finding new uh, ways of activating that space and using it and collaborating with folks that aren't necessarily the first people you'd think of um, is incredibly exciting. Um, one of the things that we are doing in collaboration with, with uh, Rick's team and, and Kirby's and, and others is we are about to announce, so don't tell anybody yet, um, a free, as in breathing, Wi-Fi project for the city of Baltimore. We're going to start around here, um, and it's going to work its way out. And our vision, and this is borrowing the idea of silos and everything else, is that internet has been allowed to silo us, even the digital halves, into I have internet in my apartment or my condo, but I don't have it in my elevator. I don't have it on the light rail, but I have it at Starbucks. And so the experiences we have get broken up by our phone reconnecting to a different network. All of that is obsolete, okay? That, that has no place in a future city. You should have a seamless experience walking from your front door to your buddies, to your Starbucks, to work and back. And you shouldn't think about the technology. It should just be there. And lots of people have tried various versions of that and they're not any successful projects that I'm aware of. And that's a shame. So we're going to start. We're going to pilot this out, and we're working with folks who know the, the folks we're going to be touching to see how we can make uh, the digital divide shrink, maybe disappear, provide better uh, access to education, um, not just in the charter schools, but even in those families, and see if we can empower uh, better access to the dignity of work through technology, not by disrupting it, by collaborating and empowering it. Now, clearly, Baltimore is made of more than just these six organizations represented on, on, the, on this panel. Um, I kind of want to know, going down uh, the row, we'll start with Dina, is there an organization on the, on the panel that you feel the contemporary would be able to partner with um, in an exciting new way? Um, that's just kind of out of the box. I think we've partnered with everybody on the panel. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm wondering. Well, is there, is there any organization that you want, you would, that you think the contemporary would be out of the box that's not here, that you would want to, um, any type? I mean, what, what, what would you, considering how you're based on open spaces, what would be the best way, or what would be an interesting way to further the mission of your organization? and reach um, people. I think it would be interesting to get more involved in city government. I don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I think that there should be more opportunities between what is happening in the arts and cultural sector and city government. And I think that artists uh, see things in interesting ways and convene people naturally uh, in ways that it feels like lots of folks in city government are trying and are doing so unsuccessfully. 
And so I wish that there was a way that the contemporary could work. Let me not say anything while I'm like leaving in three weeks, but I, I think <laughs> that there should be a little bit more interest at a legislative city, even maybe state level with what things like the contemporary work on on a daily basis, especially now, like while there are so many conversations at a federal level about continuing to defund arts, culture, humanities, public broadcast, I think that it uh, will be a dark day for the nation and that cities and states will have to pick up the slack. And I think it starts with at least putting those bodies in the room and not enough of that, I guess, happens. So I think that that's important. Okay. Kirby. <laughs> uh, I, I'm curious, um, technology, increasing, I mean, there, there seemed to be a lot of excitement and interest in the room. You mentioned about wiring the whole, the, the whole city of Baltimore. Um, how do you see that um, changing the face of downtown, and especially in this area, per se, um, bringing technology there? I'm just kind of uh, interested to hear from your, your point of view. Well, it's incredibly important. Uh, a few years ago, we provided free Wi-Fi in public spaces like Center Plaza, Hopkins Plaza, uh, at Pratt and Light, uh, but we just didn't have the resources to do it more broadly. Uh, so we think it's very important for people to get free access to the internet whenever they can. And it ties not just into technology, but it's also everything that happens in downtown. We, the, downtown is unusual because everybody in the city touches it at one point in a year, whether they're passing through, uh, even if it's just jury duty, uh, but, but somehow they connect to downtown Baltimore. And so how do you draw people into the opportunity here? So you do it through, through uh, eliminating the, the digital divide, but it's also some of the physical divides um, and even some of the great amenities we have. Uh, one thing we just kicked off was a subsidy for the new bike share system. I know there's a bike share station right up here. Uh, it costs $15 a month to ride, which is not terrible for most people, but we are subsidizing now for people who uh, through the SNAP program uh, show that they have need now it's a, we, we will subsidize so it's three dollars a month as opposed to 15 so it's those types of things that we want to do to help connect people together uh, but it's also important to add more affordable housing because we're talking about these divides. Uh, just a block up from here, you should check out Mulberry at, at Park, which is uh, an enterprise project. There's 68 affordable units, brand new, gorgeous, very spacious units there, and there's more affordable housing projects happening within two or three blocks coming soon. Uh, so it's not just the d digital divide, but the physical divide as well. Uh, but but uh, touching on the physical divide, you know, you, Deepak talked about connecting us all together digitally and connecting the blocks together physically is what we need to do. Either, even if it's through lighting, if it's through improving the streetscape, we've got to make it easier to walk through our downtown and through our entire city. Anita, I mean, um, museums, uh, what, I mean, the, the history, the knowledge you have, uh, it seems to be a real impetus to bring that into a digitized format, whether it's just for locals or for people across the world to learn more about your museum and more about what you offer. Um, can you talk about how technology affects your museum, affects any museum, and how it can better its position here in the city and who, can help, who you can help partner with in order to promote your mission? Anything along those lines. Yeah. So let's see. I think that, I mean, technology can do any number of things for museums, but one thing that I'm particularly interested in and that we've been exploring is in helping people encounter um, our collections in a different way. So we've been partnering with a, um, a firm called Direct Dimensions, which is a, a large-scale laser industrial scanning firm um, that is doing some really groundbreaking work here in Maryland. Um, and one thing that they're, well, they're doing many things for us, but one thing that they're doing is um, we have, those of you who have been to the museum, you've seen that big shipyard crane um, that marks our entrance. And it's, it's, it, it needs a facelift, so we've mounted a campaign to restore it. Um, but uh, people come and they see the crane, they get very excited about it, and the principal of Direct Dimensions, who I met through Will, incidentally, um, at an open works event, um, came down, fell in love with the crane, said, I'm going to scan that crane. So that's great. You know, we have the digital files, which helps with engineering and, you know, paint specs and all of that. But what he's been able to do is to create a 3D file that is now printing inside the museum. So when you come into the museum, you see a little 3D crane printing on a 3D printer that is created by a Maryland startup. And then um, he's also working with us on creating 
animated manipulations of the crane that you know can be moved around and can go online. So that's just one. I mean, there are many, many ways that technology can help help us do what we do. But for us, that's a significant um, partnership because it not only helps people understand better what's in our collection, in this case the crane, but he's doing it with other things, um, but also provides some visibility for a Maryland company that's doing some really interesting groundbreaking work with 3D technology. Are there any, uh, what other museums, just out of curiosity, are, really, are you really working hand in hand with, let's say right here in Baltimore, that are helping um, communication and facilitating your, your missions? Well, we're, I think that the, the nice thing about the Baltimore Museum community is it's very collaborative. So uh, there are, you know, different partnerships at different times depending on, on what we're doing. It just, it just varies from time to time. We did do a, a collaboration with the contemporary, Ginevra reminded me, many years back before my time, where, where we actually did an exhibition of bread making or something, or bread, little bread sculptures or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Deepak. I'm curious, um, you have some real aspirations with wiring the city, wiring this area. Are there any stumbling blocks that you hit when you have any of these goals with, um, with bettering community? Do you want to, and are there any um, organizations that could help um, knock down some of these stumbling blocks in order to, to create this better open access? You don't have to name names if you don't want to, but I guess, I mean, are, is there opposition to what you hope to accomplish? So the, the question about what stumbling blocks we've had, people don't have enough hours in the day. Um, so we'll skip over that part. Um, so right now, our ideas, for example, to, to bring access throughout the city are relatively new, and we've had a lot of positive uh, communications with folks, and I think it's really time for us to put up or shut up, and so we're going to be putting up. Um, I think that you know, we're engaging with everyone we can think of, and that includes government, and that includes, um, like I said, stakeholders in the area. Our biggest fear is, I think, one that technology companies have uh, accidentally stumbled into all the time, and that is being tone deaf. We think, like in this seat and my team, that free Wi-Fi is great and it's a universal good, but that may not be every opinion. That may not be every voice. And so we are trying to engage throughout the city and throughout all of the folks that we can identify to make sure that we're doing it in a sensitive way, that we are not uh, raising specters of Big Brother or surveillance or gosh knows what else, privacy, cyber risk. Um, and, and once we get sort of brought into a conversation about fears or concerns, maybe we can address them. Um, and certainly some of the folks uh, we've talked to have informed maybe how we're going to deploy, which areas first, that kind of thing. Um, and we've got some strategies to make everybody safer and more secure. But again, uh, folks who haven't been invited to the conversation, uh, we don't know what they're thinking. <clears throat> and so we're trying to engage with everybody to help avoid some of those uh, very famous but very public screw-ups. Richard. He sounds like a social worker, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you're a social worker, too. Um, what are some of your challenges that your organization faces? What what would um, like what would what would be an ideal situation that can help further the University of Maryland School of Social Work achieve some of its accomplishments? So I think our challenges, our opportunities are um, multiple. The we have many roles in the School of Social Work. The one that I focused on is as community school coordinators and. One of the things that we're probably facing in Baltimore City, frankly, is a reduction of both library and art services in the schools. Those are the kind of things that historically have gotten cut first. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get a shuttle that would take our students from just across Martin Luther King and up Pennsylvania Avenue to spaces like this to come into the arts district to get art instruction as it gets reduced in, in the schools? What if we could really pair up our students with the art community, I think that would be real, quite amazing. A bigger challenge that we have in some ways is 
that our, big, our largest focus is on the behavioral health of our citizenry, uh, the, trying to address the mental health and substance abuse needs of our community. And although a lot of that has got to be done face to face, there are huge opportunities for people to get better, to do well with um, electronic and digital support. So there's no reason that uh, if you're someone you know is having a psych emergency or a substance abuse um, emergency, that you have to take them to the hospital or have the police take them to the hospital where they can go wait in the waiting room for four to five hours, no disrespect intended, um, to get medication to, um, or maybe not to get anything because the waiting room, you know, they get sent home. Um, they should be able to, to um, get online. Someone should have a, a social worker or a police officer or a friend, should have a netbook where they can call up a psychiatrist, they can do a face-to-face -face interview, they can get a prescription, they can go to a central place where that prescription, uh, there could be almost like a vending machine that can be downloaded. It's, I don't mean to give simple answers, but we actually do have partners that are working on how to do this. So the whole behavioral health world um, needs much more digitalization. We need that in order to be providing evidence-based services and access to the many people you know and we all see uh, in, in Baltimore who uh, need better care and should be able to get that care in the efficient kind of way that digitally um, informed interventions could provide. And Will. I guess my question to you, um, I mean, I know that there's been talk, but well, there's been instances here and also like out in Oakland where there's been like studio space for artists have been difficult to, to come by. And your organization kind of blurs the art form between, um, or the, 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 between work and art, not to say one is not one without the other. Can you just um, talk about like some of the, um, some of your feelings in regards to having open spaces for and, and who you could collaborate with or could bring into your organization to help even further what you do at open space. Uh, open work, excuse me. Well, one of the opportunities I'm really excited about with open works is there's been a bunch of development along the Greenmount corridor over the last couple of years. Um, starting north of North Avenue, there's a bunch of new affordable housing. Um, going up and then right around us there's City Arts 1 and 2, there's Baltimore Design School, just south of us is Lillian Jones Apartments. Um, some of the historic buildings going even further south like the Yellow Bowl Restaurant are starting to see some sparks of life and it's a really exciting time to be kind of in these neighborhoods and what's important to me is that OpenWorks has a unique role in this ecosystem in that it is a truly public space. We have a coffee shop and a lobby with free Wi-Fi and an open door for 12 hours a day and anybody can walk in there and is welcome um, as opposed to an apartment building or a school or other things that are kind of for the people that use them. Um, and so th how do we create a strong internal community that's of, of our members and folks attending classes but also welcome in all the residents of Johnson Square and Greenmount West and Barclay um, and, and points further out from us and become a true kind of one of these rare places in Baltimore where a lot of different folks melt together. Um, we've had a few encouraging, we're, we're still kind of early in, but we have had some, a few things kind of encouraging in that, that regard. One of our members just painted a mural at the Greenmount West Community Center. And so looking at those type of organic interactions that occurred just because we built the platform not because I introduced anybody or forced anything, but that just happened organically because we exist. And so how do we keep growing that type of thing onwards and outwards? Okay. Now before we open up the, the room for, for questions and answers, I wanna ask one more question for each one of the panelists, and this isn't really a popularity contest, but um, which, I'm gonna ask you, is there another person on this stage that represents an organization that you would want to partner with, that you could partner with, that would easily facilitate your missions? What is it, which, who on this stage could, would make for an easy partner for you to 
to further to reach, whether it's in with between the two organizations or within the whole downtown area of the city. Um, uh, Kirby. Oh, what would be a good? I'm just sorry. <laughs> Wake up. There we go. Yeah, who would who would make an easy partner for your organization? Well, we somehow connect to all the partners here except for Will. So I'm curious to figure out how we can connect more with Open Works. Uh, but actually, what came to mind more so was what we could do more with the school social work because we have homeless outreach coordinators and and directors at the downtown partnership. And while we need more housing, we need more service for people with mental illness and also drug dependency. And I know through work at Lexington Market, your students are already uh, making a difference there. We we pay for the first substance abuse outreach coordinator to be around Lexington Market area. Uh, but I'm seeing, unfortunately, um, an increase in people who have these needs on the streets and we're not doing enough to help them. So I think uh, I'd like to consider other ways to continue to work with the school social work. I think the university has had very close relationship with the downtown partnership. Uh, we want to continue in that way. Um, we actually have a new initiative in our school um, a homelessness council that's trying to, um, that's pulling together uh, social workers from Howard, Coppin, Morgan, um, uh, Healthcare for the Homeless, um, Miriam's House, uh, to try to figure out how we can better respond day in and day out to uh, training, preparing and um, supporting those who are working on homelessness. So that, that would be a natural um, we're still very excited in terms of partnerships about um, trying to um, provide the kind of on the ground knowledge of what's going on in West Baltimore, not for me and my perch in the dean's office, but from our community school and outreach workers and combining with AI Net. Um, and the idea of having some of our students, for example, in Renaissance Academy um, spend some Saturdays uh, at Open Works or otherwise get involved is very exciting as well. Dina, your organization seems to like to think out of the box. How about somebody on this stage that you think could be an interesting partner and could be a new type of, yeah. of, of relationship? So again, I think we've worked with everyone. So yeah. I'm going to say that those were all wonderful experiences. Um, I, am, I am really interested in um, the digital divide, like as a citizen in Baltimore. And I'm curious about this last thing you said, Deepak, about ways that even thinking about um, absolving a digital divide could be problematic if we're not sensitive and open to communities and to individuals who are different than us, you know, in every way. So I'm, I'm interested in just that in general, and, and it sounds like it's happening in lots of ways that are exciting and interesting. We work with basically everybody here, and, and yeah. more importantly, the, the ideals, I think, that they're all pursuing. Um, what Rick's team does with uh, direct involvement in people's homes uh, in very, very challenging environments. It's, it's God's work. Um, on this hand, too, great uh, art and, and the humanities are also God's work. Um, not that I'm not religious, but it, it's important. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm fresh out today of, of new groundbreaking uh, collaborations. Um, but I think there's uh, this dialogue is going to lead to that, right? And um, that can manifest in feeding some folks that need it, as well as educating them and connecting them and helping them find work. And I think that everybody here has a, has a vote in that and, a, and a, uh, works every day to make that happen. Anita, I know what it's like to, to work for a nonprofit organization and the struggles and challenges that that, that that has year after year. Tell me a little bit about like what what who here could help you? Who or what organization in this city um, could give the best boost to what you do? Well, I'm going to pick from the panel because that's such a big okay. So it's like the yeah. dating game. Will I, I, I pick you? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> So, and we've actually had this conversation. Um, I think that uh, the Museum of Industry's links to the maker movement are, are evident and, and natural, and Will has actually put it very well, and I'm going to paraphrase you again here, but um, in pointing out sort of the through line between Baltimore's the, the sort of scrappy entrepreneurialism that helped build Baltimore and the maker movement today. 
Um, and, you know, because in the end, we are a, a museum about making stuff. So um, there are maker spaces in museums, kind of, that's been done. Um, what I'm more interested in is um, using some beautiful space we have, and I've talked to Will about this, and finding a maker in residence who will work there gratis in exchange for interacting with my visitors. Um, sort of on the, on the grounds that if you can't bring people to the maker space, bring the ma maker space to the people, people who might, might not otherwise um, come into the maker space. And I think what a museum, a, a history museum like ours has to offer to enhance that experience is that we can draw the historical connections between whatever the maker is doing today and what its historic antecedents are in Baltimore. So it provides a really um, a, a, a unique way to, um, to present the public with this idea of the democratization of making things, so. Well, I'd like to know how, how you would respond to that. I mean, it does almost <laughs> seem like a natural fit with the Museum of Industry and Open Works. Um, sure. What could you do? I mean, is there something that can go into to the, that you, that within your, your organization that could go to the Museum of Industry? Yeah, and sounds great. So we have a Open Works Mobile. We have a van with some tools and technology in it that primarily we use to um, take out to elementary schools and educate young people about technology at this point. But um, yeah, we'd love to, we're open to bringing it to other spaces and doing other things with it so we could bring some tools down there and, and do a build day. Okay. Now this seems like a good opportunity at this point because we have a nice full house here at Hutzler's um, to, to pose a question to any of our panelists. I invite any of you at any time to help answer this. that quite literally, I mean, our here with the Delta coming tomorrow. There's a draft budget coming out tomorrow that will, I believe, will eliminate NEH, NEA, um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That is not the nation's budget. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, I mean, we know what's coming tomorrow, right? So I guess my question to you all is not, you know, <clears throat> what can you do, but what are you gonna do tomorrow? I mean, really, it's sort of the biggest picture and then for your staff, for your board, for your coworkers, and for the city and for the state. Um, you know, just having this brain trust up there, uh, I just wonder, you know, what do you do daily and then how do you focus the bigger picture with the everyday running of everything that you do? So thank you. So what are you gonna do tomorrow? Who wants to answer the question? I'll take a quick stab. One, one thing that I think has become clear in the current political climate, both nationally, but also locally, Baltimore has gone through a very challenging time in the last couple of years. We've had an enormous amount of turnover in city government. There's a lot of uncertainties looking forward. And I think it just reinforces the idea of local action and organizing, excuse me, for uh, resilience and self-reliance. And that's something I look at through the lens of open works as providing people with avenues to their own self-determination and trying to extract folks from these larger systems that we feel that we have so little control over. I know that's, that's a little bit of a non-answer in the context of direct political action, but I, you know, I can't control that. What can I control and what can I move the needle on? I have to say what keeps me up at night would be the cuts to HUD, I think, um, even though downtown Baltimore doesn't get much of that money directly, but it helps the city so much. And if we don't have money for homeless programs or affordable housing, that, that makes me worry. Uh, but on a lighter note, I just realized that someone here might be able to shut down a high-profile user of Twitter if it goes through the <laughs> lines here. So maybe you can help us out a little bit on that. <laughs> Sir, you had your hand up. Nice to talk about Digital Divide, right? But are there any programs out there to help kids, for example, write code? All right, I mean, it's nice to talk. That's like watching TV one way, but then they write code, they can actually build a TV, be entrepreneurs. Are there any programs that you're planning on implementing other than just trying to cross the Digital Divide? We've been talking about it for 20 years, so it's nothing new. Any other person who wanted to respond on that question? Okay. So. No, go ahead. I have a little bit, and then no, you're, this is all you, right? So uh, there are programs already in Baltimore, like Baltimore Code and other uh, 
outreach programs that specifically help address the entree to the incubators and the entrepreneurial pipeline that I like to call it. Um, there are thousands of sites and programs now online. And so I think that the digital divide, or sorry, the, the internet piece of the digital divide is not an answer, it is just a door. And it is up to those folks who have access now, who maybe don't have access today, sorry, who will have access but don't have access today, um, to then take it upon themselves, maybe with a mentor uh, or a tutor, to then explore what meets their interests and their needs. And I wouldn't limit it to just coding or purely uh, tech jobs. Um, consumption of art and consumption of everything that makes us human is enabled by opening that door. And that's, that's our view on it. So just briefly, Baltimore has a new youth fund. Um, it's going to be uh, decisions that we made about how that's going to be used. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that it will include opening up recreation centers, but not the recreation centers of old recreation centers that do have the kind of options uh, that you're talking about in terms of, and that Deepak just referenced about a range of ways of um, advan advancing uh, technical skills and uh, digital literacy. Just quickly, three programs in Baltimore right now, Code in the Schools, Future Makers, and the Digital Harbor Foundation all teach young people to code either for free or nearly free. So you can, you can look up the three of them. Um. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Cole Hanks and I'm a Baltimore City educator, teaching a positive social change, theater and film and new media program at a Baltimore City High School in West Baltimore. What I want to talk about is accessibility. One thing, particularly since I'm a Baltimore native resident, born and raised in Lower Park Heights, has always been access. Like right now, I'm here because I've been able to navigate the white arts entrepreneurial um, enclave of stuff. Or I wouldn't have known about this because of that. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of African black folk who feel like white Baltimore makes decisions that they are not privy to. And what I want is for there to be truly one Baltimore that's touted um, instead of entrepreneurs who are white, mostly male, probably mostly heterosexual, I don't know, making decisions for people of color in a city that's majority people of color where there's tremendous economic and um, racial disparity and inequity, what can we do utilizing our skills to bridge that gap so that everybody will have access to this information and be a part of the creation of a future city that will hopefully be racially, economic, and um, embracing of all individuals? Because I'm very fearful that we are not doing that and slipping back into the malaise of everything is going to be all right, or just focusing on some boogeyman individual like President Trump, or I like to call him 45, as something we can focus on. Instead of dealing with the deep, systemic, institutionalized, misogynistic, sexist, racist things that are destroying our city. And I think that, that wasn't a large rhetoric over both. I would like to hear what you think that we can do to bridge that with all this mental power that's right here in this room. Does anybody want to take that on? That's a very, <laughs> may not have an easy answer, but. Um... So, so I, I think a partial answer is consistent with what we've been talking about, which is that um, you should have choice, uh, you should have voice, and uh, if you're a resident and both choice, and choice depends on information to make good choices, to know even what choices are available, what the mechanisms of change are. Um, the digital, uh, you know, closing the digital gap is going to help with uh, information, which is going to improve choice. It's going to help with voice. We know a lot of social media, the social media has had a huge impact in the last uh, 12 months and, and of course the last really 10 years. Um, we still have to do community organizing and in, uh, in 
Upton and Druid Heights, we're trying to do some of that through the community schools, reaching families in the schools and getting them uh, to try to articulate what their choices are and to use their voices as much as possible. Uh, but I think that uh, di closing the digital divide is also going to be hugely important to your goal, which I think is uh, a very, uh, is the right one and the one that we hold also. Kirby, I, I guess I have a question that's um, the gentleman in West Baltimore, we have here the downtown mm -hmm. partnership. Are there other community organizations, neighborhoods that you are working with that can help people in his neighborhood come work with this neighborhood and throughout Baltimore that can help bring it together and facilitate some of this information and dialogue. Sure, there are many initiatives, but you're right, we have to be intentional about it and connect people. Uh, we are, I hope I don't announce something prematurely, but we are working with the Reginald Lewis Museum to provide $10,000 to make sure we can have students from outside of downtown uh, take buses in and experience the Reginald Lewis Museum. And that's in order to connect people to what the opportunity happening here. Um, I mentioned the bike share program, things like that. Uh, but we have to realize that people are not experiencing the resurgence of downtown and some of the other neighborhoods. So how do we get them into the opportunity here? Through internships, we're funding some internships through the Digital Harbor. Uh, uh, we're also uh, you know, working with um, homeless uh, service advocates. Uh, but beyond that, other neighborhoods, uh, we, we've got to first, I still have challenges here. When you look at Howard Street, I'm not, hey, we're doing good work. But we still have a lot of challenges here. I still have a challenge getting retail to come to Calvert and Lombard Street, one block off the Inner Harbor. So, so we've got a lot of work to do here, but um, the economic impact is strong and spills out into other neighborhoods. But we've got to be intentional, and that's why we're funding uh, this, this bus program and other programs to bring students and others into downtown. It's amazing how it's hard for kids to get, in a, get to the venues here in downtown Baltimore. Did that end that? Do you want to expand on that? Uh, yeah, I want to give kudos to the University of Baltimore, sir. American University. Yeah, all right. Yeah, University. Is that the program that does the social workers in school program? And is that the part of the African American Social Workers Association? Um, you have a similar aspect? Because I was saying if it was, that it has touched our school. Um, and what you're saying right there is, what I'm, I didn't understand clearly what you were saying. Are you like reaching out to students and children of color in parts of Baltimore schools that may not have the resources to come into the city? Because I couldn't it sounded like you were trying to ship in white kids from the county to experience the wilds of Baltimore City. So I just want a little bit of clarity. Okay, Mary told you about challenging assumptions. Um, <laughs> uh, what we're doing is we're trying to get students from Baltimore City schools to experience the Reginald Lewis Museum, an African American museum in downtown Baltimore. Uh, and there's other programs like that as well. Okay, you got a question there? Yes. Hi, uh, my, my name is Blair. I'm with the City Center Residents Association. It's a nice um, neighborhood association right here. I actually live in Park Charles, a couple blocks away. But my question is for Mr. Jane. I, I, had, um, I wonder where we could find some more information about this new program, the free Wi-Fi. Um, I know you, you've kind of jumped the gun by announcing it a little today, so... Um, I, I'm wondering where we can find more information about that later, and l like I already said, I know you've already jumped the gun a little, but I'm wondering what the funding source is. Are you guys going to be paying for it? Is the city paying for it? How, how is it going to be sustainable so it's not just rolled out? And, and I understand if you don't want to get into that kind of details, but I'm very curious. So it's a fair question when you talk about providing something to a city. Uh, everybody wants to know who's paying. So our analysis has been none of these programs survive because they were relying on public funding. It is inherently uh, short-lived. It is inherently uh, challenged because of lots of other priorities. So yeah, we're funding it. Um, we've asked the city to not make it more difficult for us than it needs to be, but we've not asked uh, the city for any funding. Um, and that request is still out there. But what we're going to start is start by uh, building where we can, where we already have consent from landlords, where we already have network. We have network throughout downtown Baltimore already, um, and we're going to explore the challenges of doing it right. Um, 
and uh, I'll tell you, one of the conversations we had just last week was, how do we put these technology boxes in these city streets without changing the character of the city street? Um, technology boxes are boring and often white or black and shapeless. And I don't want to be blamed 20 years from now for basically littering our city uh, facades. So we are, we're talking to, to the arts about you know, how can we make these pretty? Um, and so, so the answer is uh, we believe it's happening. We're not asking for external funding. Um, in terms of sustainability, we believe that our business in the city is going to be healthy enough to keep it alive. Um, as we do technology refreshes for our commercial customers, uh, we don't see any reason why technology refreshes, uh, which are upgrades to Wi-Fi and things, um, can't happen at the same time. Um, and we're talking about a free, high quality level of access as its bare minimum. Um, there might be fancier things that we throw in. Um, but thanks. Nick Perry, just one quick follow-up. Um, I'm wondering, so you've talked about residential access. I'm wondering if also you had uh, some, kind of, some kind of thought in mind as far as a smart city turning uh, the access to the infrastructure. So I know some people, when it rains a lot, uh, the sewers back up into their homes. Maybe if we had sensors in, in the pipes, then it could give them kind of a warning. or. You know, we have the uh, the light rail here. It, it gives them a, a time of when the light rail is supposed to be arriving. That kind of smart city grid. If you're putting this information network all over the place, maybe we can use it in that sort of manner also. Just just one. So the short answer is, I would love it. <laughs> um, technology is, and this kind of access is just a door. If somebody wants us to walk through that door with them and give them a live status for when the light rail is more than 300 feet or less than 300 feet away, I'm in. If they want to automate their electricity so that they can save money uh, in an apartment and then a building and then produce lower CO2 emissions for the city, I'm in. Um, if they want to take an older building and then make it um, connected to our city network, so that everybody in the building and uh, the city streets are all in the same network. That takes cooperation with the landlord, but we're in. And that includes access so their cell phones have E911 access so that a first responder knows exactly where in a building they are, especially these older buildings, that reception isn't there. We can fix all that. That's technology. And I think I'm the, the tech guy on the stage. So the, the limits of what um, you're talking about, I'm not aware of any. And there are lots of projects where people have tried little bits of this. Um, and there are lots of historic problems, like city of uh, uh, Alexandria has open sewers, and it's a huge mess when it rains, literally. Um, there are lots of ways to improve that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would actually say that the strongest audience for the ground is the audience that's already here. Um, we, in the four years that I have been at the Contemporary, this is the first project we've worked on that has such a lively um, sort of street demographic. There's a lot of street traffic. People walk up and down these. This block in particular, I mean, that was one of the reasons I wanted to know how many people come down to this block, because people will fight for this neighborhood. We will fight for this neighborhood. Our offices in this neighborhood, we love it. But this block in particular is really interesting, and the demographics of it are really particularly, um, I think, resemble a kind of thing in Baltimore that we always talk about and talk around, right? So this, the type of street demographic that is here comes into this project every day that it is open. 
And I think the thing that is my favorite thing about this project is I feel like it has just interrupted people's day a little bit, right? Like they're not used to this, they don't know what it is, and we have gotten questions about this project from are you a Rite Aid? So that was like their first thing, that it was just really bright. <laughs> is it a spa? <laughs> to apparently a gentleman who came while I was not here who had already walked in and had sort of what he saw in this was a kind of narrative that really resembled Sodom and Gomorrah and thought a lot about what was happening in the city and was depicted in this piece. And all of those things are equally beautiful, right? What I think that the problem that the contemporary is, and it goes a little bit to Coley's question, right, is like we can't get past a certain core audience unless that is very slow and very specific, right? So like we're not gonna wake up one day and have a totally different audience than the one that we've had for the past four years, five years, 10, 20, 30. And it's something we think about every day. My question for Coley is actually, do you have a solution to this thing? I wanna know how you found out about this event and I wanna know if you brought anybody with you and I also wanna know if, why you didn't if you did not bring anyone with you, right? So like how, how can the contemporary get to a place where we are advertising to a larger demographic than the one we serve because our street demographic and our core demographic are never the problem. People ask us this question like, how are you not reaching out to the demographic that's right outside your doors? We never have that issue. And we never have the issue of the kind of audience I know you're already assuming like a core art demographic, right? Like the kind of art person, largely white, back to Coley's point about the sort of racial difference between various art communities in the city. And we have one, usually out of MICA, has probably moved to Baltimore in the past five years, if hasn't lived here before, or has been here for 20 years and has been pretty active in an art scene. Like we know our demographic pretty well. I'm thinking a lot about issues of technology and how we use things like Facebook and various online news sources to advertise to people and why it is that we can't connect to different demographics living all over the city. Thinking about transportation, right? From an infrastructure perspective, the city is not very inviting from people to get from one end of it to another and that puts our nomadic museum in a particularly sticky situation when we're in neighborhoods that are not often and trafficked. And then the last part is really just like the ways that we talk about Baltimore independent from each neighborhood stigma, right? And some neighborhoods are, you know, young white art kids. We can never seem to get past that place. Other neighborhoods have violence as their kind of stigma, and we can never get past that. And I'm wondering about ways where everyone on this stage, but also everybody in the audience, can like dismantle that thing piece by piece. Because I think in a lot of ways it's been the reason the contemporary can't shake outside of a certain thing. Because there'll be a project that is a kind of narrative that should be of interest to everyone living in the city and will see similar faces often. And if it does expand, it's slow. It's never large. And so, I don't know. I think the ground has done a really beautiful thing for this block in particular. Um, and I think every project before that did very special things for the locations that they served. I see a hand in front of Ashley. Is it okay if I just take that mic? Is that a, I'm just going to decide that that's a yes. Yes. <laughs> Wait, can you can you say that just a little bit? That program like at Baltimore Price Stars and it's gone. The programs that are that end. Remember Price Stars? You were part. There was there was a program called Bright Starts, and due to funding and some other issues, it was terminated. Um, and revamped, it still exists in another form where schools will reach out and select um, an arts um, professional to come in, as opposed to offering a broad range. Yeah. yeah, but to address the question that you were posing, it's really very simple to intentionally reach out to schools, after school programs, um, parole officers, all programming where individuals may be needing their minds stimulated differently and letting them know that it is here and asking certain individuals, a parole officer, a teacher like myself. Um, I had to show for a student home because it was an issue of potential violence after school um, and I had to address that issue. That's why no students, I brought them with me. But there's other time I'm always with children in tow, young people in tow to different events. Even if there's no funding to get them down there, they are educators who are still committed that will bring one or two students on their own down if they were to know about it. And if there is a fee, if that fee could just be waived for that educator and students and get the information to them. And there will be within each school, two to five educators that will personally transport or there is a committed parent that will bring children to it if just simply being aware of it with someone intentionally 
like the gentleman talking about a individual in the school that say this is here, it is free, you just get there, you can experience it. Yeah. And, and that's to, the intention yeah. to do it. But also back to this thing again about like smart cities, infrastructure, like we have, right? So this idea of reaching out to schools, programs, city agencies to sort of include demographics that we know won't know a thing exists unless we go there always becomes about the funding, the logistics, how do we get people here, how can we transport them? And I feel like, I just wanna say that because as we're talking about other ways to grow a smart city and thinking about infrastructure in these ways, I mean, for us, transportation has like always hurt us, like no matter how hard we've tried. And yes, there's always amazing teachers like yourself that bring their students out of pocket and figure it out, but that's not sustainable, right, for like a healthy city where kids and students all over should have access to every arts and cultural activity happening in the city at any point in time. Like that thing to me is just like bananas. Um, and we've never found, and it's gotten worse. In the four years I have been at the Contemporary, there were resources that existed here in 2013 that just are not here anymore. Um, so certain programs that you could get to shuttle kids or students to certain things that just have completely ceased to exist. Now I'm just like ranting about this thing that I hate. I'm sorry to say there's talking and there's doing and we've come to the end of our scheduled time here today. I know, well, we can have another conversation. I know we're gonna be here. I wanna thank Will, Richard, Deepak, Anita, Kirby, and Dina for being here. I wanna thank Ryan and Deepak and everybody here at AI Net and, and the Contemporary for bringing life back to Hutzlers. I thank you for coming down here today and being back at Hutzlers. I hope to see you at the symphony. Thank you.